You're listening to a 4x4 Radio Network podcast. The Center Steer Podcast, a Land Rover podcast by Land Rover owners. Welcome to the 27th edition of the Center Steer Podcast. I'm John Costed, your host here in wonderful, rainy, unseasonably cool uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, the weather is supposed to be, what, 80 degrees. Uh, it is currently like 65 degrees Fahrenheit and rainy. And we've been seeing rain for the past uh, couple weeks, it seems, and it's all gloomy. But this is the podcast. And with me in the studio is... I'm Harold. And... And... Carol, Dave's back. Welcome, Dave. It's been a while since we've had you on the podcast. Fresh yeah. from the trail. Fresh from the trail, fresh from the farm, countryside. And as part of the underground uh, Land Rover Underground Railroad, he's delivered my sand ladders, which are fantastic. So yes. thank you for that. Yes, yes. It, it took some time, but they're here. But he forgot my cookies. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, it is, uh, the summer and there were kind of light on Land Rover news and we're also light on, on panelists. Uh, folks are taking vacations or having babies. And, uh, so, uh, this currently at the moment as we start to record, it's just the three of us and we're hoping that maybe some others will be able to join us. Uh, very potentially we might be able to get, uh, Dan Cole, who's with the four by four podcast currently at the Northwest, uh, Overland show. He might join us from the trail uh, or from the, from the, the Overland Expo. As soon as he gets signal. Yes. So uh, we'll see if he can join us. I did uh, talk with him ahead of time, and he was going to join us, but unfortunately uh, he's not with us right now, but he might join us later. So uh, as we get into it, uh, why don't we do that and start with uh, news. Uh, uh, first up, uh, as you may recall, Will Hedrick, and I said Hendrick in the past. I apologize for that. Uh, he is the defender of the defenders, and there is a story that was done by the local Fox News down in North Carolina, about Will, uh, although actually it didn't turn out to be about Will at all. Uh, it's entitled, North Carolina Woman Has Land Rover Seized by Federal Agents. So there's a, the point here is that there was a news story done about the seizures. Will's seen it for a few seconds, but really it's not about him. Um, so if you, we'll have a link to that on our, in our show notes if you want to check it out. Of course, the big news, which is the story before the story, is that the, the war is over, so to speak. The defenders are free at last. Yay. All of them? Free at last. Uh, free the, at the case was settled against all of the defendants, and the government has until, I think they had 30 days to return them, uh, so they are on their way back. A number of them have been reunited with their owners, and the rest will be within a matter of a few days. And that's right. I, I now recall that uh, we recorded the podcast, and right before the announcement, and then by the time I got it posted, the podcast posted, the announcement had come out. The settlement came the day after we recorded last time. Yes. Actually. And I think we might have put a teaser in the show notes. But yes, uh, in case you haven't been paying attention to the news since our last podcast, uh, the matter has been settled, and Will has prevailed. Yes, uh, all, all uh, and he did. He did it all pro bono too. The owners of the trucks didn't have to pay uh, for an attorney. He took care of it all himself. As he, as it actually is indicated in the news article uh, that, had, that was done, uh, it can be quite expensive because usually the value of the of the possession you're trying to get returned is less than how much it's going to take you in lawyer fees. So most people tend to give up. Which is why the government has no actual experience in litigating these uh, uh, asset forfeiture cases because they never go to trial because nobody fights them. Right. Either because they're they're criminals uh, or they they can't afford to. Right. Right, because it's probably something that's not all that expensive, and the lawyer's going to cost you, you know, five hundred bucks a pop. So I understand that the government was had no idea that these people were all going to fight, and that they were all going to get the same attorney, and that same attorney was going to show up with a ton of homework, and just, you know, they they just kind of like tucked their tail and said, "Okay, fine." Yeah, yeah, but I think a lot of it was around the fact that the VIN numbers were incorrect. They just they were kind of sloppy on VIN number. Rec- well, they didn't do their homework. They didn't. They didn't. Uh, when they traced those VIN numbers to determine the age, they didn't do a very good job, and, and they just didn't have a lot of supporting documentation behind really anything. But they didn't understand what they were looking at. Yeah, that's 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 a lot of it, and and you know that kind of goes to you know part and parcel of why they target defenders is because they are a little bit hard to understand because the parts can be swapped so easily, 
but yeah, they just they didn't do their their homework and didn't really know what they were they were dealing with. And, and they're used to them going uncontested. They had no idea that, that someone was going to step up and, and represent a, a unified front for all these trucks and to do it for for no charge. Well, and these folks didn't get off exactly scot free. Um, they did get the vehicles back, but if there were any damages to the vehicles that totaled up to less than three thousand dollars, the settlement dictated that the government was not liable for it. So you could bang a defender up halfway decently. Um, From what I've understood so far, there haven't been any cases where anything was seriously damaged. You know, a few door dings here and there, but I just saw somebody today was saying that. They had a front fender that was banged up. He wasn't mm. sure what the total was going to be. Okay, but that's that's where I read about the, the three thousand. Yeah, that that sounds fairly typical. But I mean, you got to consider that every one of these trucks has been sitting for a year, so it's it's going to have to get gone through, and that's right. going to be at the owner's expense. Right. Well, I think that's where you start tallying up the three thousand. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it, it, to be valid points, but at least they get their trucks back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, absolutely. Well, that's, you know, that's yeah. the point: is that they are getting their trucks back. You know, you know they're never going to recover for for loss of the use of their truck for the year and all of the, the mental distress and all mm-hmm. that, and, right. and of course the cost of, of getting them serviced again and but, having federal agents with guns at your door for for, oh, yeah. for the truck that's or that your seems. parents' house in some cases maybe yeah, scaring right. your parents, scaring the family. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, like you say, the bottom line is they have their truck back and they can get on with their lives. Right, right. I think, as you said, I think all 25 are going to be returned to government expense yeah. within 30 days. And then, uh, and I think no further action was going to be taken on these trucks either. Yeah, as I understand that they can't. There's no recourse. They can't. can't, <laughs> can't uh, I think that's what they call dismissal with pretty. prejudice or something like that. I Without prejudice, I think it's without. No, maybe it is with prejudice. I think it is yeah. with prejudice. With it sounds prejudice. counterintuitive, but I think yeah. it's with prejudice. Right. Basically, double jeopardy is not. Well, what it double jeopardy applies to people, and these are not people, unfortunately. That's true, and that's why they were seized that's very right. easily. That's, that's why they they don't have to be innocent till proven guilty because they're not citizens. So should I uh, should I incorporate my truck as a corporation, and then since corporations are people, then it would be alluded to would be uh, that's between you and your attorney. <laughs> Fair. Transfer all of your guns to it. it yes, that's true. Own, yeah. own all of your guns. Yeah, that's a good idea. Good idea. They're maybe good. maybe a Montana corporation. They seem to be pretty friendly up there. Nice, nice. So, uh, and, and there is a way to help out Will since he did do this pro bono. If not mistaken, we had a link to the uh, GoFundMe site. Yeah, there is a site on GoFundMe which is just raising money to uh, help Will out because, uh, in case you weren't. Paying attention last month, we mentioned that Will quit his job to pursue this. He had a job with the state of North Carolina, and he decided that helping people with these sorts of causes was more important than his, than his paycheck. And so he's he's gone out and gone private practice. And so this is sort of a little little fundraiser to say thank you and to help him recover some of the time he's invested for free. Uh, in the... 24 days since this has been up as of this recording, they've raised $8,300 American. They're looking to get $25,000. That's great. Yeah. I, guess. I, I did see that uh, as a result of all of this, he actually was invited to and gave a lecture to the uh, a number of students of the Wake Forest School of Law. Yeah, I saw that too. He, uh, Will is considering it a high point of his career. Yeah. <laughs> he said they even looked like they enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, that's that's got to be more more of a high point than anything else. It's one thing to show up and talk to students; it's another to have them be interested. Well, I think he said he spoke for two hours. Yeah, well, that's, that's, <laughs> to get an applause after that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, applause versus relief. Yeah. So, if you're interested, uh, there is a link in, again on our show notes. If you want to, if you're anywhere in the world, I believe you can help out on this GoFundMe. Yeah. So. And in addition, um, there's sort of a, a two-step mm-hmm. process to this, but the guy who put this uh, GoFundMe together, uh, he's got a post on the uh, Defender Source website, uh, which I think we'll have a link to in the show notes as well, uh, where he kind of describes the, the procedure. But if you donate at the $50 level for this GoFundMe, you can get a very nice Defender of Defenders grill badge for your truck. Oh, and if you donate at the hundred dollar level, you get a special edition one with a serial number stamped in it. 
And if you're feeling particularly generous and you want to donate at the $200 level, you can get a limited edition uh, Defender of Defenders badge that's mounted on a special wood plaque. But you have to go to the um, Defender Source uh, posting where he he, uh, he lists the procedure because you have to give to the GoFundMe and then you have to send him an email to a certain address with your uh, shipping information. Uh, so go there and read the read the rules, so to speak. But I encourage people to give, especially if you can give at that level. And, and I think it's really kind of incumbent upon all of us that have rest of world trucks to support this issue. And, and I'd like to see one of these badges on every rest of world rover. Good, good thing to try. Would, would that happen on a new Range Rover? Do you think they'd put a badge on there? If somebody can find a way to get past the 25-year exemption on a new Range Rover, go for it. <laughs> Now, if you want to put it on a U.S. spec truck, that's fine, too, to yeah. show your support. I'm, I'm all for that. But I think it's especially incumbent upon owners of rest-of-world trucks because this is what this is about. It's Will fighting for our rights to have trucks that don't necessarily uh, – well, trucks you can't get here, but there is still a legal means to have them. He's defending our right to do that, and, and that's important to preserve those rights. I may have to get one. I'll have to go black myself because – Quite honestly, if I put it in my truck, it's just likely to get scraped off against the tree rock. <laughs> well, so donate uh, twice as much and get two badges. Yeah, I'll, I'll get us there. Maybe put, put, put it on Velcro truck. so you can move it from truck to truck. There we go. Yeah. Uh, the Velcro would still come off. Dave would find a way. Oh, yeah. 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 Actually, you know what, Dave? For you... You could weld it on. Well, I, I'm, I'm thinking I could make a nice receiver mount. There we go. And you can just move it from hitch to hitch. That would work. Next up in the news is the Range Rover Sport. Uh, it has a remote control app from your phone that allows it to control. You're able to control the vehicle from outside the vehicle. Now, did, my, didn't James Bond do that a while back? He did in a BMW. Yes, as a matter of fact. But he did. It, of course, he did it from inside the vehicle. So he was in the back seat, and he was, you know. I think he did it from the outside. When Q was trying to teach him how to use it, he just grabbed it and ran circles around Q. And right. But, well, then there's, but there's the fight scene, though, where yeah, 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 yeah. And he's in the back well, seat. He's being shot at. Uh, he's being shot at, and he's going around this uh, parking garage, and right. he's getting thrown around a vehicle, but he's still able to hold the phone and still get thrown around a vehicle without being belted in. Yeah, without false signals to the accelerometers in the phone or anything like that. Oh, that's true. Think about that. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. But, anyway, but you can now do that with a Range Rover. The only problem is you can only go four miles an hour. So the Range Rover will go at maximum four miles an hour uh, off road, but then it, it, good and bad, of That's course. As fast as you need to go off road most times, anyway. Right? I think so. As slow as possible, possible as, as fast as necessary. Yes, and apparently Land Rover's decided if you're using remote control, and four, apparently four that number is four. That number is four. Uh, four is the number, and the number is four. I could use the herd livestock. Well, there you four go. You, you've now come up, Dave, with, with a, a, something I hadn't even thought of. That's actually not a bad a idea. Practical use. Yeah, mm-hmm. hey. it is. Since sitting behind the wheel and doing it that way isn't good enough. You could sit there in the lawn chair, sipping a beer whilst herding cattle. Well, I, I mean, it would, it would be like having a second person. I could kind of wave one arm around to encourage them to go away from me, and then use the vehicle to herd them off even further. Yeah, and I was thinking along those lines of the second person that. If you're on the trail and you don't have a second person with you, that this would be a way for you to be your own spotter. Yes. You could watch for obstacles and, and using your, your remote control, steer your vehicle around them and over them, et cetera. Ooh, I'm, I'm just waiting for the head book. Yeah. Seeing through the bonnet. Yeah, 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 yeah. They had a few months back. I think that would be better. I, I like the idea of the, of the, of the remote control, so there's, there's use case to be made, but that takes all the fun out of being off road and, and going through the obstacle yourself and figuring it out. Yeah, but so does power steering. People like that. <laughs> <laughs> but that's still, that, that's doesn't I mean, take, you're you, still in the vehicle though. You're still, but you, you, know, you know, taking uh, sport out of it true. is taking sport out of it. I mean, I suppose. Either, you know, you add these convenient things that allow more people to get into it or you make it so easy that anybody that can do it. So, I mean, well, and then you Pick your side of the argument. Add limited foot desks and lockers. And let's go find out harder places to go. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, I guess, uh, well, yeah, like you said, there's good and bad side. There is one good, though, on-road reason for the remote control app. And if you watch the video, it's only two minutes long, a minute and 57 seconds. But uh, 
the, the driver walks up and he's in a parking space and the other two cars are too close to it. So you can't get into the vehicle. And he, you know, of course they don't show you how long it takes, you know, how to get your app out. You probably got to connect and do all sorts of things. And during that time I could have climbed in over the hatch and crawled over. Probably right. Yeah, exactly. Or the, or the other driver comes and moves their car, but of course, I'm skinnier than some, too, so that helps. True. But even still, the car, may, it, it may be difficult to get that door open and shimmy in between, you know, the opening there. So that was, I thought, one good positive. I can keep the hammer in the trunk. I'll make one. <laughs> For your 90, when you, when you spend $90,000 on your new uh, Range Rover. I'm not car, hitting my right? truck. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what I am. It, it's nice just to see the apps on the phone because I pulled into a... a an outlet mall parking lot two nights ago with Megan, my 13 year old daughter. And there, there was an evoke parked out away from everybody. And so I had my usual tow vehicle, my Dodge. And I pulled in because I was hauling a bunch of stuff and it was way too long for one space. So I ended up just happening to park next to this evoke. We got out of the car and there was a cell phone laying on the ground. And Megan's like, oh, look at this. I picked it up and pushed the uh, little button on the iPhone. And it lit up, and there was a Land Rover app on it. I figured, oh, it belongs to a guy in your ebook. I set it on his windshield. Hopefully he got his phone back. <laughs> because he happened to have a Land Rover app on his phone. You think that app could have that, that been used to unlock his door and put the phone inside? Was the phone unlocked? I did. Yeah, it was unlocked. I, I didn't even fiddle with it. Uh, you know, if you have an app that gives you control of your vehicle, I think it's incumbent upon you to lock the app or lock the phone. So you well, can't. I don't care if it controls a vehicle or not, because this is when I. Well, but especially if you got it in control of that, or, or you know, locks for your house or whatever. It's oh just, yeah. yeah. I mean, too much stuff is on these things yeah. now that you know you need to keep your phone secure. Well, I have to keep it secure. Hey now, hey now. That's <laughs> rover porn. You're talking about of rover course, porn. Course, rover yeah. porn. Yeah. Well, and this is when I... Hey, I will freely share my Rover porn collection. I don't need to keep that secret. And, and you bring up a good point that I have to... My information security hat that I... My daily job comes into play. And, like, how is it... I, I want to know how this app connects to the you know, connects to the car. Assume it's Bluetooth, but how secure is it? And, you know, how do they change that security? And, you know, obviously, clearly the car's locked. So does that, does that work in conjunction with the... Uh, you know, with the keyless entry, and I assume it does. But you know, these are things that I question and wonder about because keyless entry is very easy right now. To there's a small number of cars that are, it's not difficult, not trivial even, to break into a car uh, if you have keyless entry. Because all you have to do is get a range extender on the thing, go up next to the car, and it communicates back to the inside of the house, and and the car then thinks that the uh, key is right next to the door when it's not. Boom, you get into. Do you have part numbers for this? Uh, so where we can order these parts? Yes, yes, seventeen dollars okay. off of eBay. All right. Uh, so what, they, what the recommendation is, you take the take your key fob and you put it into a Faraday cage, basically. All right. So they, we'll be the, putting this on the show notes where people can buy these things. So. I will have to track it down. My understanding is that there is uh, that there are parts available on eBay, but I'm not going to. Uh, so, so now we're how to show. I'm not going to encourage anyone to commit any criminal act. So there, because that would be a criminal act of stealing. So that is remote control of uh, your Range Rover Sport. There's nothing in it about I, I will add Rovers. one more thing to that. Uh, I think another potentially uh, useful uh, use for the uh, useful use. Yeah, there we go. Good language. Uh, if you're on the trail and you get into a particularly sticky spot and there's like a steep drop off or something like that, you can get out of the vehicle and you can, number one, spot, like we said, be your own spotter. But you can negotiate the vehicle through this tricky spot, um, and if something goes wrong, you're not in the vehicle when it's rolling down the cliff. Yeah, that's true. Um, we did have a couple of experiences last weekend where we we had people who felt the need to hang off the sides of vehicles in order to keep them from actually laying over on their sides. But not. But wouldn't you think that being in the vehicle gives you that extra sense of what's happening to the vehicle if you're outside of it and you're like, okay, I'm gonna you know go this path, and when you're in, yeah, the, and that may be well, it's different. On than the other hand, when you're standing there next to it, you can much better see when when a particular tire is no longer in contact with the planet. You know Fair. what I really want? Fair. I, I want the app that's going to unspool my winch 
drag my line across to the nearest <laughs> secure point, and then winch me out. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Get a harpoon. Yeah, I was going to say, that's called a harpoon gun. Yes. All right, start, start working on it, Harold. I need one. <laughs> Can just tell you these air compressor harpoon that yeah you you you'll, you can use your heads up display mm-hmm. with the uh, with a clear bonnet and then you can shoot that at the at the nearest tree. Three, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Slow Batman's moving. been doing it for forty years. So yeah, I was going to say slow moving vehicle in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> Take me with you. Uh, next up in Range Rover news is uh, the Queen, Her Majesty, has a new military parade vehicle. Uh, which by itself is not that stellar of news because I think she can pretty much have a new truck whenever she wants it. Oh, uh, yes, uh, clearly. Uh, the interesting news of this one is the first time I've heard uh, anyone, in particular Land Rover, doing a hybrid diesel. So it is, in fact, a electric and a, and a diesel engine. Uh, that's the first I've heard of that, which we had talked about several mm-hmm. podcasts yep. ago being a neat idea. Why isn't someone doing it? It makes it to me, it makes the most sense for the hybrid. What I want to know is, uh, did Land Rover suggest this to the queen or did she insist on it? Uh, insist on what? The hybrid diesel technology. Oh. Did she say, I want something which is hybrid diesel or, or, or progressive? I don't um, want an ordinary Rover. I want something special because I'm the queen. I, I'm, I'm wondering if this is not a little demonstration technology uh, okay. because they can do that. And also with it being an open air vehicle, uh, you know, there's, uh, they looks like they, uh, at least one that they demonstrated it here, this one was done inside. So I'm thinking maybe that, that having that the electric hybrid so you wouldn't have any emissions. So, while so, you're so this is a case of Land Rover saying, hey, we have this really new cool thing. Uh, you're to see, would you like to show it off for us? Probably. Okay. Probably. That yes. makes sense. Yes. Well, I, that's my guess. Well, uh, that, I, I like to clear. think of the possibility that there might be a progressive monarch out there that would like to move uh, us into the future. I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure there's something to be said for that, too. Yeah. At least she drives. She likes driving. She's actually, you know, she's, she, she drove back in World War II. She she's a retired spanner monkey. Like, Yes, she drove. She drove ambulances. She, she drove time. trucks, and mm-hmm. she, she she actually spun some spanners. I don't think uh, the queen retires from anything. By the way, I think she, she just doesn't do it. Someone else is taking over. Yeah, that's pretty much that, retirement in a sense. Well, that, the whole country is hers technically, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but she can retire from the duty of, of changing tires on the fleet if she wants to. <laughs> Although I don't think she I would pay to see the queen you know, changing tires on the. Uh, you're right. Yes, yes, I give you that. Not old pictures. I mean current. Current, yeah, current, current. current no. would be cool. I mean, I, I love that story where she she jumped in with the uh, was it the Saudi ruler and and started driving him around and oh scared the bejesus out scared the bejesus out of him not just because women don't drive in his country but she was taking charge. Mm-hmm. Good for her. Oh yeah, I, I like her. I really do. Uh, and now joining us uh, live from Vinyl Haven, Maine, an island 15 miles off the coast, is Jeff Aronson. Hi, Jeff. Hi, guys. Hey, Jeff. Hey. Uh, Jeff, as uh, our listeners probably know, is the uh, editor of Rovers North Magazine, Rovers Magazine, uh, a joint of Rovers North, right? How's things going for you? I am on a deadline for our upcoming issue, which, uh, frankly, I think is going to be, a, as we say in Maine, a corker. And we're looking forward to it. Wonderful. But um, things are dandy. My Land Rover, my blessed 66, is used every day. Looking forward to its, what, 50th birthday coming up? Nice. Next year. Oh, good. And, uh, that's, that's the one you call the QE? That is the QE1, okay. exactly. Very good. Yeah, good. Well, we, we won't uh, keep you uh, as much as we, as we would like to, uh, so we will just move on with the news items. Next, we are going to talk about uh, is the two millionth Land Rover, ha- uh, two millionth Defender has been produced, and it was a special build. Um, and this uh, was done with, I think, 33 people brought in from the outside. Special Vehicles Unit did Real it. who's who of the rovering world, if you will. And that included uh, some of the names here, which I thought were interesting. Uh, sons, sons of the Wilkes brothers, for one. That's right. Yeah, the Wilkes brothers' sons, uh, and they used the Red Wolf Bay imagery in the in the design of the vehicle. They, they have some plates on the side of it. They have which was the family estate of one of the brothers, as I recall, a uh, the farm or something like that. Right. Uh, yeah, I think they had a Vacation farm. They had a farm home, nearby. Think, or yeah. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so they used that also in the seat covers um they also use the um 
old Land Rover logo, which has the like the Z through it in the in the background there, and they put the two million uh, number uh, new, two millionth production number on it and stuck that on the vehicle. I thought that was kind of a new little ode to the old days. Yeah, and the, the two million seems to be uh, stenciled on in a number of places on the truck as well. Land Rover likes putting. The Land Rover well, all over the vehicle. And, well, but yeah. if you want to show off that it's a two million, yeah. you'd, you'd want to have right. the, the, that number visible from every possible angle. Right, right. And uh, this vehicle will uh, also be uh, auctioned off in December, and they're going to give the money to the uh, International Red Cross and to the Born Free Foundation. So if you're looking for a new Defender, this might be the one for you. Too bad I can't own it on this continent. <laughs> <laughs> Could you bring it in at all? Maybe there is a, a, a possible exception for exhibition purposes. I see. You could drive it on the road, though. Uh, minimally. Okay. Maybe gotcha. in parades, that sort of thing. I, but see. I don't think you could actually like go get groceries in it. Yeah, I think one of the Camel Trophy discoveries got in that one. Oh, okay. But I think you kind of need to set yourself up with some sort of bona fide museum of some sort to, to qualify oh, for I that. I see. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, also on the special design team was uh, Roger Cranthmore, Mr. Land Rover. Uh, Craythorn. Craythorn. I always get the name wrong, so my apologies. Uh, Tim uh, Sluss- Slusser. Mm-hmm. Slusser. Yeah. Slusner. Uh, he was the uh, gentleman who was on the first Overland and wrote the book on the first Overland. What was that, 1955? Four. Four? Four, I believe. Mm-hmm. London, to, London to Singapore. London to Singapore. Right? Yes, and we talked about that in one of our first uh, podcast shows, as a matter of fact. And we've, uh, had, we've had Graham, who produced the video on cor- our show. Correct. Mm-hmm. And uh, they also had uh, Virginia McKenna, uh, Will Travers, uh, Theo Pafalis. Pef- uh, yeah, he was one of the Shark Tank type people. I know that. Or apologize to his whole family for that. <laughs> I know. You think I would know how to say Greek names. Uh, and Bear Grillis uh, was also on the special design team. I like so. how Bear makes a particular mention of, of the fact that the, the Defender has saved his bacon many, many times. Yes, and the production crew, too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's <true. laughs> There's a, uh, I think a three or four minute video. Uh, we'll have a link to that, of course, in the show notes. You can ch- check that out, and they talk about it, and they show each of the special design team members are participating in the building of the vehicle, even if it's just to stick some stickers on it or tighten a bolt here and there. But I thought that was kind of nice. There's nice a job touch. for everyone. There, as there, there is, there is, and they were all glowing and 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 uh, enjoyed the experience from what it, from what it sounded like. As would I think anybody. I know I would enjoy that. Oh yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, it, yeah. That would. It you're wouldn't right. Have to be number two million. If that would do any of them, I'd be fine with that. That's right. Yeah, that's that'd right. be fun. That would be. Uh, apparently, the two million, by the way, comes from all uh, similar lineage uh, Land Rovers built back to 1948. So we're talking series one, two, three, the 90, the one tens, and then ultimately the Defender. So I'm actually somewhat surprised that that. that number would include all that. I think that they would have hit the two million mark before now if, if they're including everything. Yeah. Actually, if you look at uh, production numbers, though, uh, if Land Rover was able to produce and twenty five to thirty five thousand a year, they consider that a pretty good year. Really? Yes. Wow. Uh, the same uh, the same hand build that is celebrated in that wonderful video, John, that you referenced uh, is also the reason that they were limited in how many they could produce each year. Right. Sure. There's only so many people they can they can pack in there to build them by hand. Right. Well, I think they even uh, I, I think up until this year, they were only running one shift out of instead of three for the defenders. They were only building them one shift a day. Uh, so you know, numbers have not been. As they weren't they weren't reaching maximum capacity. I just I just find it interesting because I thought I read somewhere that they'd hit the half million mark by by the early sixties when they were switched over to the Series Two A. I thought it was, uh, and I'd have to look it up. It's a good point. I I want to say though it was a little later. Okay. Um, than that, and they would be including knockdown kits that they sent to other places. Oh, sure, and there was a lot more uh, in terms of military contracts back then too. I think. Yep. That could have inflated the numbers. James Taylor's wonderful book on the history of the series rover actually has a dated photo of when that half millionth and then the millionth one went out. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, that's right. There was that millionth. There was that special picture they have. I remember they took and Yeah. Hmm. All right. Well, I, I guess it makes sense when you think about it. It just kind of struck me as, as surprising on first glance. Right, right. Okay. Well, if you are the lucky 
uh, winner of the uh, two millionth defender, and you uh, once you take possession and you want to, you can join us on the podcast. You have free opportunity to join us <laughs> on the podcast at any time. We'd love to hear about it. Uh, next John, up, John, if I yes. oh, go ahead. John, if I could, um, relative to the two millionth defender, uh, you may uh, have seen if I can put the pitch in. Uh, a recent issue of Rovers Magazine where Roger Craythorn sent us wonderful photos of creating the Defender build line. Mm -hmm. yes. And though he, uh, the president of Rovers North and uh, Mark Laterney and his son, Caleb, who's a vice president of Rovers North, both went over to some global sales meetings in the UK just last month um, and a part of their um, meets was to take that tour of the Defender build line. And Mark and Caleb both said it was a remarkable experience because they do give you some hands-on feel as to what it took to assemble a series Land Rover uh, at the factory. They put you in the outfits that you would have worn, those huge protective leather aprons, cow suits, they call them. <laughs> and um, nice. give you a sense of both the noise and activity, uh, as well as the physical labor that was demanded to get rover after rover down that assembly line. And if you remember, uh, even it's still an issue to this day, but except for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, except for the period in the 1970s when the British pound was so expensive compared to other currencies and the Japanese yen so relatively undervalued uh, there was never a uh, there was never a surplus of Land Rovers the series models available it wasn't until the mid 70s later 70s that dealers started to run into just having a lot of them on their forecourt most of the time you back ordered one hmm. so that assembly line really had to crank in order to fulfill worldwide orders do you know if was the original series Land Rovers available in the United States? Like the ones, the twos? Up you know, one of the this they were all available, but if I can digress for a second, uh, back in March, uh, I went to Land Rover North America and had the delightful experience of being welcomed into their archives. They have two mm -hmm. enormous rooms. Uh, on a wing of their relatively small building, one for Jaguar, one for Land Rover. And their archives of everything from advertisements to board meetings. And one of the things I discovered was the very earliest Land Rover models were not brought over by Rover car company themselves. They were brought over in, consolidate, uh, in cooperation with Roots Motors, Hillman, Sunbeam, those guys, mm -hmm. they struck a deal with Roots because Roots was really interested in trying to penetrate the American market. And Roots distributed Land Rovers in those early years. There was not a U.S. subsidiary, really, mm -hmm. for the Rover car company until the early 1960s. So there obviously weren't many brought over because um, Roots was relying on independent distributors in the U.S. to care about having a relatively expensive utility vehicle like a Land Rover. And Roots wasn't that big here either at the time. No, they wanted to be big, but they weren't that successful, right? Um, in It was in the early 1960s that the Rover company actually established a U.S. subsidiary, and I sat there looking at the board minutes from the 1960s, and there was all kinds of optimistic hope that maybe we could sell 2,000 Land Rovers a year in the U.S. <laughs> and the subsequent year's board meeting would always note how we weren't quite able to meet oh. that sales goal from last year. Wow. wow. Not that many here compared to their worldwide. Sure, sure. What do they sell? To, they, they probably sell 2,000 a month now, or it's 1,500, something like that, of the current, based on the numbers we've seen. The other interesting point, and uh, <laughs> the other interesting point that came up was I found a late 1960s list of dealers in the U.S. No, oh. and when you <laughs> when you see that some of them were tractor companies, 
Some of, <laughs> some of them were makes five sense to me. Companies. Yeah, makes yeah. perfect uh, sense. And when you, uh, very few of them were independent dealerships looking to sell just Land Rover or Rover. They were always combining it with something else. Right. And it was very hard to to demand that kind of a attention to the model when you're selling with other brands. I think back then, it's sort of a cultural thing. Uh, you know, you ha in a town, you'd have the the Ford dealer, you'd have the G uh, Chevrolet, maybe maybe Chevrolet Buick, and, and you'd have those sorts of lines, and then you'd have the other dealer that sold everything that wasn't made in this country, the so-called foreign car dealer. Exactly. <laughs> Which I, I hate the F word. Uh, import, <laughs> import's much more palatable to me. But yeah, you'd have that, that guy who sold the imports. Right. Well, it's even in Pittsburgh had the Ascot Motors for years, and that was basically what they did. They sold Land Rover, and they sold, um, and they sold uh, Bentley, and half a dozen other things, Lotus, up until what five years ago, ten years ago. I think it's more like ten years ago. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, gentlemen, can you see this this pen and letter opener I'm holding in my hand? I do. I do. Yes. Um, and if you we put, it I put it in the magazine happens? once in my column because it was so entertaining. In Rockland, Maine, around 1920, a dealership called Miller's Garage was established. And sometime in the 1960s, they sold the following models. Imperial, Chrysler, DeSoto, Plymouth, Hillman, and Land Rover. <laughs> nice. So can you imagine that you wanted a Chrysler Imperial with full Baroque interior <laughs> and fins to reach the sky, and in turn, that same salesperson might be able to put you into a Land Rover? Sure. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah. It's, it's better than a Land Rover salesman trying to sell you an Imperial. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Well, yes. But it, it really wouldn't make sense. That everything you listed there was really affiliated with Chrysler. And Land, right. Rover, Land Rover through their back door with Roots, because at the time, Roots was in the middle of, of an affiliation with Chrysler. Exactly. Exactly. I think this this would predate it just by the, the use of Imperial as a separate model line. But it did sort of indicate to me just how franchise, uh, how dealers would simply pick up an inexpensive franchise, and it solidified that that Roots Land Rover connection right. prior to Rover coming over on its own. Right, and, and by the way, the Imperial was often uh, represented on their signage up into the 70s as a separate make. Was well, it really? It wasn't a separate make, but it would be on the sign separately. Interesting. And the badging on the car said Imperial by Chrysler. <laughs> Very neat. I, we've learned things. I didn't know all this. I was a Mopar guy back in the day. Well, and yes, and I want to toss in while we're talking about the Defender, a unique opportunity that I was fortunate to have this past week. Um, Land Rover North America, when it brought the Defender 90 into the U.S., uh, needed to work on some from the U.K. to try and figure out what they were going to combine them with in order to make a special North American model. East Coast Rover, the Defender Specialists over in Rockland, Maine, um, called me to say that they had in for repair and refurbishment the very first 90 that was brought in to be called an NAS 90. It actually has a plaque on the back that reads L-I-N-A-1, and it has certain features that show that things were just sort of cobbled together to see how it would look and operate for the U.S. market. It is also um, actually in AA yellow, and you see that it's the same one that's on the original North American Defender brochure. So you look at, there is an air conditioning system in it, but when you look at all the pop rivets and everything holding it in place, you realize that somebody just found one to put on it just to see how it would fit and what it would look like. If you look at a Defender 110, a North American Defender 110, there's that wonderful sort of plastic piece that indicates a group of warning lamps to identify when the four-wheel drive is on and so on. Well, that's stuck on the dashboard, 
even though that never appeared in the North American 90. Interesting. And the, here's, the most, here's the most entertaining one that Mike Smith of East Coast Rover pointed out to me, and I wouldn't have seen it in daylight like that. Way back in the 70s, uh, our highway transportation uh, administration determined that nobody would be able to find a defroster if it, if the, it wasn't illuminated. So you had to put a little light by the defroster switch that's still in, in effect today. So lots of the British cars had problems with it because they expected you to do that by feel. But in the end, because they all they had to put the those light little, bulbs to work. And that was it. And we know the light bulbs don't work. So they put that little peanut lamp behind it all. Well, this, this particular Defender has the twin levers for the airflow and the defroster with the pointed arrows and the little icons, but it doesn't illuminate. Somebody just tossed it on there because the Brits never insisted on this, just tossed it on there to, to see what the dashboard would look like. But it's not, it, it wouldn't technically be road legal until you actually put a lamp behind it so that you could illuminate it. There were lots of little features like that uh, the the uh, vent flaps are a little different. The windshield folds down, even though it wouldn't because of the safety cage. It still has the uh, nuts and stud that hold the series windshields in place. That's cool. That's cool. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. It, um, it it's owned by an enthusiast uh, in New York State who owns three others, all of them in AA yellow. <laughs> Nice. And he has picked up this one, and he sent it to East Coast just to have some repairs and minor refurbishment done. Clearly been uh, uh, repaired in the past. It probably was in an accident at one time. Looks like that kind of repair. Um, but uh, it's running, and it was wonderful to see it and wonderfully unique. We'll, we'll have some photos of it in the upcoming issue of the magazine. Oh, good. Do you know if the uh, – does the owner use it routinely? Uh, it had not been driven in a while, which was one of the reasons he had it sent up there, and it was to get some fluid replenishments and to check things out. Honestly, the only change that East Coast Rover made to it at all was um, they have created over the years, uh, in all of theirs, a braided stainless steel oil cooler line mm. so that uh, those oil cooler fires will be eliminated, at least from that source. Hopefully. Uh, that's Yes, that's the only thing that they changed in it. Otherwise, they've left it just as is with an eye towards capturing that prototype look to it. Now, is this prototype mechanically identical to the, the, the North American 90s as they came in production, or were there some changes there, too? It looked, uh, when I opened the hood and I took some photos, um, it looked very similar. Uh, there were a couple of small things that Mike pointed out, however, um, that it looked like they were still trying to figure out how to route some lines, maybe, okay. uh, and what the, the most efficacious wiring might be. There's definitely a couple of connectors that, to me, look like either it was a bad repair sometime in the, in the past, or they were just connecting something up to see how it might function prior to production. Sure. It's, but it is a 3.9. Uh, it is a 3.9, yeah. Normal yep. three bits we were used to yep. see. But yes, it is. Now, is this uh, brought over prior to the, the one year of the 110 North Americans, or was this brought over similar period? Because I know the 90s came out the year after that. That's right. Mike, based on the dates of the uh, brochure, that was a British published brochure with some American information in it. It looks like it was probably done, maybe um, finished up eight months or so before the 90 actually came over in 1994. Okay, so it's probably concurrent with the 110s coming over. Sure, because it okay. did have some 110 internal items on it. Sure. Interesting. But it was neat to see it, and the uh, first time I had ever seen uh, a prototype one. Now, you were you were saying uh, before we started recording that this particular gentleman has four 90s? He has four 90s, all of them the same AA yellow color. So, so I guess that you know when he tries to tell which key is for which, he doesn't does, doesn't have a tag that says yellow ninety on it. <laughs> How many prototypes were there? Do you, were the all those four were the, those all the prototypes, or was there only one actual prototype? Do you know, I don't. I, I honestly don't know. Okay, I, but I have an opportunity again. This was a very fortuitous 
chance here on this island, which has a sort of a vacation feel to it this time of year. Um, we have one motel on the island and the owner of the motel stopped me on our little main street one day to say, I think there's somebody at the motel you might want to meet. And I said, why? And he said, because he told me he's the man who introduced Land Rover to the United States. Whoa. Wow. Anybody guess? Uh, no. I, I should know this because I saw it on your Facebook, but uh, I'm for, it's not coming to me right now. No. Okay, so it, it was a bit of a hyperbole, but it turned out to be Charlie Hughes. And Charles Hughes was the first president of what was then Range Rover North America. Mm. Would have been in 1986. He was brought on board um, for the newly created subsidiary to bring the Range Rover into the U.S. That's and right. it became Land Rover North America when they brought in the Discovery as well. Okay. Change the name for that. Right. Um, Neat. But it was a nice opportunity to spend some time with him. And uh, it's very possible that one of those early AA Yellow models was actually owned by his wife. Because during our interview, she gave a sort of stern look as Charlie was describing his life with the Defender to say that it, that was her car and he sold it. Oh, <laughs> Ooh, Ooh. Was right. Damn. And she's still married to him. <laughs> and she's still married to him. Probably and trying to get another Defender. And right. she's holding holding that hostage is clearly over and holding it over <laughs> his head. She hadn't forgotten. That was no. a long time ago. No. <laughs> <laughs> and you, Brent, man, it came right back to her. There was no delay. <laughs> it Bam. came right back to her, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a very pleasant interview with him, and we'll have some, I'll have some tidbits from him nice. in the magazine. Well, that's really cool. That, that's that's very nice and fortuitous. Fun. Yeah. Good deal. Well, I appreciate all that, Jeff. That's that's good content there, right there, and we'll Thank see, you. and that'll be all in the upcoming uh, episode, editions of the uh, Rovers magazine, right? Right. It, it'll be in our uh, July issue, right? Is that, and that's the next one that's coming out, July. That's, that's the summer. The next one. Yep. Yeah. And and when will that be in my mailbox? <laughs> as soon as I can fly it down. <laughs> okay. Probably late July. <laughs> all right. And for, for listeners, if you uh, are not familiar with the magazine and you can check it out, you just go out to uh, roversmagazine.com, I believe, right? That's a legit website that for that? That is it. And, that is it. And you are welcome to download any previous issue. And we try and get the current issue available for download for those who don't receive it in print uh, within a week or so after it comes out. Right. Do you ship worldwide, or is it only available in North America? Or you, you know, guess? we really only send it uh, by subscription to the United States and Canada. Okay, yeah. but you but you can get it available in PDF form off the website if you're anywhere in the world. That's right, and we do, and uh, we have a lot of requests from the UK for it. As as rightly they should. It's a it's an excellent <laughs> magazine. I I certainly enjoy it. It's, is it also read. linked from the Rovers North website as well? So people yes, yeah, people, people want to find right it there. It. Yeah, there's a link right to Ro from Rovers North. Yep. Yep. Okay, very good. Yeah, the same place. I'll ha and I'll have uh, links, uh, of course, on in the show notes. Thank you. Oh, absolutely. Well, uh, next, uh, since we uh, kind of along the lines of lovingly talking about the Defender, um, Petrolish Petrolicious, it was easier to say without speaking it uh, in my head, uh, is a uh, website that kind of usually focuses on vintage sports cars, maybe maybe a, a sedan or a motorcycle. But they did a kind of a nice 10-minute uh, celebration of a Defender owned by a photographer who lives in Mexico. He's an American living in Mexico by the name of Sean Regan. And uh, it, it's a nice, warm, fuzzy, uh, gives you that nice feel uh, if, if you, if you, why he has a Defender and it gets him around and he lives in it and drives it every day and, uh, and uses it for his, his work. He, he apparently, he's, as he said in the video, he worked for the federal government in D.C. and then moved and then decided to get out of that business and, and became a photographer. So uh, check it out. We'll have a link in the show notes. Uh, there's a, I got a lot of stuff this month from Autoblog, and they, that's where I found this article. So, Jeff, I believe you have met Sean. Is that correct? Uh, we have only met online and as a contributor to Rovers Magazine. Sean and his uh, significant other, Mitty Roger, um, both live, I believe, uh, just in, Gu in the Guadalajara area of Mexico. Um, Sean was a Latin American studies major and um, took his graduate degrees in Latin American culture, worked, as you said, worked for the State Department for a while, and then really decided what he wanted to be was a traveler and 
participant in Latin and America and moved to Mexico. Mitty's father had moved down there. He runs a sort of craft tequila company, which seems like a great thing to do in Mexico. <laughs> yes. It sounds like the and, only thing. Uh, Mitty is from uh, uh, Louisiana. And they have both traveled extensively in his Defender 90. She writes a travel blog called Girl Wanderer, which is wonderfully written, um, believes strongly in the value of travel, uh, both as an individual and as an expansion of uh, cultures in general. There, his photography is superb. You may have seen articles on them. They recently went to Guatemala, and we ran that story in the magazine. They've traveled also extensively around Mexico itself and are looking to take a long trip into the South American continent, and that's his next big one. Sean, uh, recent, uh, within the past couple of years, converted his NAS-90 from its V8 to uh, a diesel, Land Rover diesel, in order to get better fuel economy smart, uh, and to make it more affordable uh, for him. It just makes um, it a better truck. <laughs> Everything's better with diesel. he's very happy with the TDI, very happy with it. Good. Um, they are uh, very articulate, both, and very passionate about what travel has meant for them. I think that video did a wonderful job of expressing that, too. It, it, it sounds like they need to meet up with Graham and Louisa from A to A. Yes. You know, um, I had the pleasure of meeting them at uh, Overland Expo this year, as well as a number of Land Rover Overlanders who came up from Brazil. There was a convoy of them. Oh, yeah. And they were the most delightful and intriguing people. Uh, when we think of what a Land Rover might do for us, I think of hauling around landscaping equipment on this island and occasionally going to events in New England in a Land Rover. These people live every day out of their Land Rover, and they've managed to make possible what really is only in our dreams. And they're not, they're not living uh, barbarically. They're not wealthy people. They are making this all work by simplifying their lives and focusing on how their vehicle can be their transportation between continents instead of how their vehicle can either be a status symbol or an off-road, um, you know, uh, off-road status symbol of its own. It's really remarkable, and to see what people can accomplish when you just set your mind to it. Yeah, I think you left one part out. They also had to figure out how to how their vehicle could be their house. Yes, and I hadn't left it out because I am awestruck by how little you can get by with. And throw in the fact that they have two growing children. Uh, and becoming oh, Graham and Louisa, yes. Yeah, and both of teenagers. them are terrific. Yeah. The kids were fabulous. Yeah. The Brazilians, um, none of the, one of them was traveling with children. The others were just uh, man and woman. And, but they were capable of, de of articulating why they would do this in multiple languages. A couple of them have written some books. At a, at a young age to be writing books, if you will. I'm yeah. so impressed. And it made me just sort of slink away in what was a rental car in a motel when I went back to over. <laughs> I didn't want to say where I was staying. <laughs> it was so embarrassing. I had hot water and stuff like that. It was really embarrassing. And a roof that didn't leak. And my roof didn't leak, right? Yeah. It was really amazing. The bells have... His uh, Graham's book is just delightful. It is. It is. It's, it's a very good book. Yeah. It's a. Uh, of course, you know we've had him on the podcast. They're wonderful people, and I still communicate yes. with them. And uh, still trying to get him to come to Pennsylvania. So we'll, we'll, I continue to work on that. But they're headed to Alaska. Uh, that is the ultimate destination. And uh, looks like they they also met up with uh, Dan uh, Cole from the Four by Four podcast. Oh, good. good. He's he's uh, heading. In fact, they're this weekend at the Northwest Overland Expo. I think that's what it's called. And uh, so they were also there, and Dan was there, and they got to meet up. And I think uh, Graham and Louisa did a presentation that uh, folks attended. So uh, Dan said that was good. And both parties are on their way to Alaska. Yes. Everybody's going to Alaska. It seems like Apparently everybody I know. it's the place to be. It is. I, just, I, I know people, people that have moved there. 
yeah. it was one big adventure. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. You may remember an article in the in Rovers magazine about two years ago by a young woman who drove her discovery f- from their home in Alaska to what was going to be a new home yeah. in Florida. Yeah, right. yeah that's right. a great story. Uh, Sarah Hamilton. And the family lasted two years in Florida and has decamped back to Alaska. <laughs> and she just drove that old used discovery of hers all the way back to Alaska. Nice. Good for her. Nice. nice. Great. Yeah, absolutely. And they've moved back to, uh, where was uh, Governor Palin from? Wasilla. Wasilla, Wasilla Alaska is yeah. where they moved. I'm, by the way, as a side note, Jeff, I'm amazed your uh, command of knowledge and facts about people that you uh, have met or heard or talked about. They just You pull the stuff up. I'm, I have to say, nice job. And the fact that Thank he doesn't you. butcher but, their you know, names. One of the joys yeah. of editing a magazine about Land Rovers is you meet Land Rover enthusiasts. And if there are any who you wish who you regret meeting, I can't remember them at the moment. It's a <laughs> fabulous community of people. How can you not remember the joy and excitement and entertainment they bring you? Well said. I can't. You, you've, you've done a great job of saying that. It's exactly correct exactly correct and you see that in in graham's book as a matter of fact it's kind of the same you get that feeling from him the community that he's met as he's gone especially in brazil uh and i think even argentina uh, those places uh, come to mind to me and uh, he's met great people along the way and people just extend a, a helping hand and a, and a welcoming hand no matter where, he, where he's gone so just because hey you're driving a land rover so you must there must be something right about you and you know in the automotive enthusiast world that with many other brands of automobile, there are just huge cliques that form Mm -hmm. almost around purity um, so that Porsche owners are still concerned that there are some water-cooled Porsches being made. You know, uh, and and Not to mention the heresy of the engine up front. (laughs) Sacrilege number two. Yes, (laughs) correct. So... that just, you know, it really, it, it, it might happen briefly in, in Land Rover circles, like with the Freelanders or something like that. But it really washes away mm-hmm. over time pretty quickly. And that's why the Land Rover community is just such a delight. It, it bonds us in a manner that um, other pieces of machinery, whether they float on the ocean or uh, whether they ride the roads, just don't seem to have that equanimity about them. Well, it, it transcends all the class distinctions, which is very nice. Very true. Well put. You're right. You're right. It does. That's always been a hallmark of it. Cattle farmers and queens alike. Yes, yes, yes. And Richard Hammond's line, I believe, right? <laughs> Something like that. Yeah, I'm paraphrasing. Collie farmers. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> Well, speaking of community, uh, we've done something here at our local Land Rover club. Uh, we have a, a one of our club members is uh, not doing well medically, uh, and so we have pulled together uh, a GoFundMe to get his disco back on the off-road uh, so that he can have a, one more adventure with his son, who's five. And so I just uh, use a few moments of podcast time to direct you to our GoFundMe site, in well, fact, I think the last time he had his truck on the trail was after the the son was a newborn, and I think you didn't you have a shot of him I, right after he was born. Uh, yes, or he, was he still in utero? He was in utero at the time, and then you had a still photo of his birth. He was born, I think, a, two weeks. I think yeah. after, within two weeks of our so last it's trip, been some time since he's been on the trail. Uh, yes, the truck uh, shortly after that, I think, came off the trail, and then uh, it, it went back on the trail. I think one more time, but uh, the point is, it had you know, he had. Uh, the truck stopped functioning, and then he got medical problems, and and since then has not been able to fix the truck. So well, he's certainly, uh, you know, it's lowest on his priority list because, uh, you know, they're having trouble just just taking care of the bills, and so the, yes. the truck had to be back burnered. Correct, correct. And uh, so we'll have a link to the, uh, as I said, to the GoFundMe if you're so interested. Even a few dollars uh, would help. Uh, Harold has done a, and we have the, we've had the truck towed to Harold Shop. And he's done an assessment of what needs to be done with the truck. And uh, I think you have a, a short list of things. We can get it back on the off-road. I have a short uh, so. list of things we have to do and a longer list of things that it would be nice if we could do. Yeah, right. Absolutely. So, Errol, yeah. have you seen the Facebook page of this humorously entitled Northeast Coalition of Used Land Rover Parks? I have. Harold, I don't know. If Dave, Harold has. yeah. This is Dave. I have. 
I'm actually a member over there. Well, I'm just wondering if if uh, uh, there might be people who have some spare parts that are in reasonable condition that might help out with this effort. Interesting. I don't idea. remember seeing a poster that linked these two together. That's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. that's that is a good idea. Dave, you want to help us out with that? Yeah, we can we can work something out there. We'll look into it. Okay. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take a look at Harold's list again. I I mean, I've read through the list. Yeah. And I'll see what we can do. Okay. Good deal. So that brings us to the conclusion of the news for this month. Uh, we will take a short break and come back. So welcome back to the podcast, and we will now move into uh, kind of uh, trail news and show circuit news. And uh, first up, Dave, you most recently were at the Wilds. What, what have you been up well, to? Well, actually, it was the Unwilds this year. Uh, the Green Oval Guild from the Central Ohio uh, Land Rover Enthusiasts Group uh, decided that they were not going to do a Wilds event this year for a number of reasons that I really won't go into here. Um, but they did instead a summer rally at North Bend State Park in West Virginia and were able to use a number of abandoned county roads. Uh, apparently the state of West Virginia publishes maps that include impassable roads that they no longer maintain. Um, and at this point, uh, I'd be hard-pressed to tell you exactly which roads we ran, but let me just say that they were hairy. <laughs> now, as I understand it, West Virginia is positively infested with these unmaintained roads. According to the maps, yeah. yeah. It's and no different than Vermont, right? Because Vermont is the same way, isn't it? I haven't been. No. no? Vermont, has, Vermont has similar roads that are listed as um, public right-of-ways, but are not maintained by the state or by towns, but they are accessible and it's legal to be on them. Okay. Well, and that's the case with these too. Um, according to these maps, they were all all still public right of ways where we had every okay. right to be there. And on this particular trip, we didn't have any trouble with anybody in getting into these places. Okay. Um, getting back out was more Mother Nature fighting us. But uh, well, that's what we want to hear about. Now, well, now, right. as I understand it, these roads are on the map in the same location that the rivers are on the map. <laughs> I wouldn't call them rivers. They least. became rivers, did they not? Well, yeah, <laughs> there, there were a couple of spots where I was thinking, you know, if I winch my truck up the side of this hill and wait for the water to go down, maybe I'll actually get out of here tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's always exciting to be down in a relatively flat stream bed and hear flash flood warnings going off around you. <laughs> so, so the trails you said were were kind of like normal, normal, uh, unimproved roads. So they were probably just like a, a muddy, not a muddy, but like a dirt trail. And then the well, they, there were places where you were hard pressed to tell exactly where the road had been. So okay, these the grown that, over to say that these roads were were not maintained. Mm -hmm. They probably haven't been maintained in forty or fifty years. I would guess. I see. Sounds like they perhaps were never built. No, no, they were. They had definitely been roads. Okay. And someone, our second day on the trail, um, someone, we, we had trouble locating the trailhead because we followed this road down it, and it seemed to end in a stream bed coming out right next to a person's property. And we knew that we were in the right spot because somebody remembered, oh, yeah, two or three years ago we went through here, and the guy was getting his mail, and he thought it was great that we were going up and using this. Ah, he said, right. you almost never see anybody go up in there, and when they do, they usually turn around and come back, or they just disappear. Um, <laughs> well, it is West Virginia. Well, yeah, and we did pass a couple of abandoned vehicles. Um, I've done that in southern Pennsylvania, too. That's, oh, yeah. That happens, yeah. yeah. So what happened with the with, with the rains came? And, and, and well, the rains came, and we had to ford a stream a number of times. And that, well, there was not a stream before. It didn't look like it, or it didn't look like it was anything near what we experienced. And right. We ended up uh, having to winch a couple of vehicles through. Any close calls? Did you have any close calls? No, no. Actually, I, I did okay on that one, strangely. I, knock on wood, I managed to not break anything or 
become inextricably lodged anywhere. You are that was rare for you. Yeah, I'm good at breaking stuff. Yeah, yeah, you are. You are. Yeah, I, I've actually come to the point where I just don't actually fix some of the things anymore, so that I don't break them next time. Oh, gotcha. So, uh, how many trucks were there? Were they all makes and models of of Land Rover? Was there? There were, there were 15 trucks, um, mostly Discoveries, twos, ones, a mix of ones and twos. Okay. Uh, the ones we had a one that was almost completely stock except for a lift. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had a one that was completely locked. He was uh, actually the trail leader. Right. Um, defenders? Any, uh... And there were three, yeah, at least three defenders. Oh, that's good. Um, and they were all, that, like, one of the guys, I didn't get his last name, uh, was, a, was a guy that had, that's run the Vermont Overland Trophy a number of times. Oh, okay. And... He had a blast. Yeah, and he was he was ready to keep going. Um, Any he, freelanders? Yeah, no, no, no mighty free, freelanders. Come on, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Got to be some. I, I'd have worried had somebody turned up in one of those. <laughs> I, I think we all agreed that had somebody turned up in an LR three or an LR four, it would have been bad. Really, it, it would not have come out well. So the, I, I guess I guess the rains made the road slick, and and because it's mostly clay, I assume if it's if West Virginia is like PA, it's probably mostly like yeah, clay. Yeah, there, right there was surface. a lot of there was a lot of clay. There's actually yeah. some video on that somebody posted of of me getting good and stuck. Mm-hmm. I think I did point. see that one. You kind of went beached it. Well, yeah, I, po- I tried to pop up over a little bump mm-hmm. on, onto a flat section of the trail, and the truck just slid sideways on me. Despite my mud terrain tires and right, my best efforts, it, it was going in the hole whether I liked it or not. Gotcha. gotcha. And later we watched a guy almost lay his D two on its side in that same spot. Hmm. So what else? Ha- so you is there a, a gathering in the evening? And uh, yeah, did we, you camp nearby? We camped at the North Bend State Park in West Virginia. Yeah, they were very accommodating. We yeah. they knew why we were there and what we were doing, and they thought it was great. Yeah, uh, they had a little primitive camping area that had water and some portage ons. And then we had access to a full bathhouse at you know their right. regular camping area, which is really set up to cater to people in RVs. You know, we had full access to it, so we had access to hot showers and actual indoor plumbing and whatnot. So, so what part of West Virginia is this? Is this in the Panhandle? This is down near Parkersburg. Oh, okay. Like kind of central west, central West yeah. Virginia. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So it, it, coming from Pittsburgh, it was a great trip. It was yeah. less than 100 miles. Yeah. Um, they're already planning to do this next year, if not sooner. There, there was a lot of talk about people wanting to get down there and do it again. Right. We ran into a guy while waiting to locate the trailhead who stopped out of the blue. He saw a bunch of Land Rovers sitting on the side of the road, stopped and said, oh, yeah, my my dad and my brother both drive Defenders. Hey, I got 100 acres. You want to come camp? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I can show you where all the great trails are. <laughs> There's your community again. Yep. Yep. Is uh, that How close is that to Helvetia? You remember, you, it was. That sounds like Helvetia area, it, now that I think of it. I don't think so. I, I wouldn't go back to Helvetia. Helvetia was like central West Virginia. Yeah, this is, I think, further north. I think okay. this is closer to, like, right. the, the, the yeah. crotch, if you will, where the panhandle separates Right, off. right. Yeah, Helvetia was bad. Yeah. I, it, angry people that didn't want us there. Well, we, we were outsiders. I, I think it wasn't always that way. I no. think it sort of degenerated into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that may be. It, it so, was not, that was not a good experience. This was a very good experience. And and uh, where else have you been? Anything, anywhere else lately? Well, it's been a while since I've been on. I actually participated in the Robazonia Trials event in April, nice. and that was phenomenal. And where um, does that take place? That takes place in Robazonia, Pennsylvania, which is I. It's out toward Roush Creek. So it's like Central North, PA. North, it's it's Harrisburg. North, it's more northeast. Yeah, gotcha. I think I think it's northeast of Harrisburg. Okay. Um. I know that I get off at the PA Turnpike Harrisburg exit, much as I do when I'm going to Roush Creek. Right. Um, but I then continue further east. So what takes place? Uh, uh, so it's a trials event with stages and gates. Which is a very um, technical type thing. It is an extremely technical type event. 
Uh, it's completely different from most off-roading that I've ever done. Uh, but it allows you to have an exciting event on a relatively small piece of property and accommodate mm -hmm. a bunch of vehicles. Right. How many showed up? I want to say 15. Is this a Land Rover exclusive, or do you have a... This, is, this one is Land Rover ex exclusive. Okay. The Green Oval Guild event is not Land Rover exclusive. We did have a Toyota one, a 2013 SJ Cruiser, oh. and it did not fare too well. Yeah. Uh, mm. It left on a flatbed. Oh, that's not faring well, no. That's not. After the first day, it left on a flatbed. Before the rains came. Before the rains came. Gotcha. In shame. So, so Robosonia uh, has, it's a trials event. It's a trials event. They do this every year? They do this twice a year. Okay. Uh, they do a fall and a spring trial. This is hosted by the Rovers Club? Yes, it called? is. It is hosted by the Rovers Club, specifically Lyle and his father, Dave. Okay. Um, and it is, I can't say enough about the Robosonia trials event. It is the yeah. most fun event I think I have ever personally attended. And it's fun because? Just the challenge. Yeah. And I, for me, the best moments are when we're out of the trucks, talking to each other and helping each other out, getting through a, a section of trail. And in the Robazonia Trials event, that's what it is all about. Mm -hmm. Getting getting through each stage, you do one vehicle at a time. You get through each st each stage, and everybody helps everyone else. You know. How did you fare? I came in, I guess, fourth out of fifteen or so. Out of fifteen or so. And I, and I think what needs to be explained here is that part of the challenge is that you lose points if you clip these gates. Or if you have to stop and back up and take another run at the corner. Well, if you if yeah. you back up, you shunt. You take your score. Yeah, you get one. You get one shunt. Mm -hmm. um, which adds a, a real challenge in a 109. Yes, it would. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. so when they built when they build the stages, they use different vehicles. They use an 88, and they have discoveries mm -hmm. and right 110s and 109s and. Each stage, there's no one vehicle that's going to be perfect for all of the stages. Nor should there be. Correct. Um, and that's what keeps it fun. Yeah. But. Good. Yeah, it's. Do you know who came in first? What vehicle? No, off the top of my head. That's fine. Just curious. Actually. So it's your, you would go back and they do this twice a year? His name is Dan. And okay. He, and he just friended up to me on Facebook. There you go. So what do you have coming up? So. Uh, what's your, over the what's next your... couple of months, there is the Equestrian, the Victory Cup outing. Uh, it's really a car show Let's on see. the 11th of July in New York. Okay. Uh, I'm not going because, as we discussed, when my truck shows up, they go, oh, no, you you go to the back. <laughs> <your> <laughs> servant's entrance. Um, then the Northeast Land Rover Club has their event called the annual on the weekend of the 18th of july okay uh that's going to start apparently friday of that weekend it'll start at roush creek and then saturday they're going to move over to the anthracite outdoor adventure area oh, that'd be cool yeah it's, it's a very cool very cool area that's coming online it's a it's a publicly owned hmm off-road park operation yeah okay and it's bringing it's bringing some significant business into a relatively otherwise economically depressed part of the state of pennsylvania the only problem with that that is british grand uh, british car day at the pittsburgh vintage grand prix yes yeah i know which right. will be that's my next event anyways <laughs> but again that's probably some place that they really didn't want to see my disco anyway <laughs> You'd be surprised. Nah, they like people, to. People like to see them getting used, yeah. and yours certainly is proof of that. Well, yeah, they, you have to you have to understand at the at Ridge Grand Prix, where we have the only vehicles that are actually like used true. every day and don't have to be cleaned. Oh, right, the, the, you know. I, I can well, tell I you clean that mine. The, the, <laughs> the filthier that my meat wagon has been, the better it is placed in the show. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, Absolutely. I, I got to find somebody to park next to me in a in an Oxford blue V two then. Yes. So in a completely stock one because I want to show before and after. Right. Absolutely. 
So you've got Robosonia in July. Anything else coming up in August? Yeah, there is a Mid-Atlantic Overland Festival coming up in Hollidaysburg, Pennsylvania. That's not that far. For bad. those of us in southwestern PA, yeah. that is just outside of Johnstown. Yeah, that's not that far. No, it's not. When yeah. is that? Uh, that is August 13th through the 16th. Okay. So I might be able to make that. All right. Yeah, I was thinking about at least running out there for a day. Anything else on the horizon? Uh, I'm checking up on whether or not there will be another conclave event at the Cove in September. Okay. You know, the Cove is always a pretty entertaining kind of place to wheel. Yes, it is. Um, I want to take my 109 there someday. Yep. Last time I went was in the disco. Yeah. Okay. Good. October's looking kind of bare. No, I want to, if I could interject, I know the Mid-Atlantic Rally oh, will, Rove, yes. Mark. will occur again, and it will be in Giles County, which is uh, the Blacksburg, Christianburg, Virginia area, so that's near your West Virginia towns. Is that the uh, first Dave, weekend of October? describing the, the uh, right-of-way trails, if you will, that you were allowed to use in West Virginia, the location of Mar that Mid-Atlantic Rally actually includes some uh, trails that take you into West Virginia. When you come out of some of those trails, yeah. you're actually in West Virginia at that point, and you describe them beautifully. You really don't recognize that they were roads other than the fact that they happen to parallel some stone walls in the middle of the woods. Neat. Otherwise, you wouldn't know that it's a road. And also, um, I know that um, the Arkansas Rover Group is going to hold another rally. They skipped a year, but they're going to be back at the Super Winch off-road park outside of Little Rock. This coming, and that will be in the middle of October. Now, are you planning to go to any of these events, Jeff? I am hoping to be able to once again go to Mar um, for uh, the beginning of October. I would love to go to the Arkansas event. We haven't had a correspondent there in a couple of years, and it would be wonderful to do. It's a great group of people, uh, many of whom I met at uh, this year's South Texas, uh, the SCAR event in Texas this year. And they really have a wonderful off-road group. Cool. The uh, uh, Mars, is that going to take place the first weekend of October as it has in the yes. past? Yes. Okay. In the first weekend in October, another, there is a uh, uh, motel and some lodge accommodations within 10 miles of the event, but okay. most of it's camping. Yeah, right. Uh, and camping be. at a beautiful hillside location. It's a fabulous campsite. Uh, would you drive the QE1? I would love to. Unfortunately, it's unlikely because I can't get a per diem from the magazine to cover my costs of actually the day it would take me to get there and back <laughs> each way. Uh, I'm on a <laughs> my yeah. magazine's uh, salary doesn't cover extra days like that. Right, right. Yeah, I, my fir my very first uh, Land Rover event was Mar back in two thousand three, I think. So it'd be nice to get back to that. That yeah. was it's a, good. It, they did a great, great job in the new trails. These are hillside, largely hillside trails, and they're fabulous conditions. Challenging, but there's always uh, there are always trails if people don't want to see their vehicles risk any damage. There's always side trails that parallel them. Right. But they're very technically challenging and very delightful to do. Uh, the last time I was at Mar uh, was right next to the James River. Uh, there yes. was a farm. Is it different? This is a different place. Yes, I believe that was Penland Farm was probably the location that they had at the time. Yeah. And that was in the, what, eastern part of the state? Yeah. Northeastern part of the state. They moved to the western part of the state because the landowner uh, has 700-something acres that he's offered – to Mar to go ahead and make trails anywhere they want. Oh. He farms it commercially, but he doesn't need much of the hillside land. And he's urged them to please enjoy it. Uh, much like you were describing in West Virginia, uh, that is an impoverished, relatively speaking, part of the state of Virginia. And therefore, the county commissioners who um, Mar wisely contacted prior to choosing that site. Um, got right behind the the presence of the group so oh. they have reasonable support and public acceptance of seeing them there yeah. how, how many years have they been at that location i believe this it was really only their second year at this okay. location i, th I seem to recall that was last yeah. year they were for, okay. their first yeah. i wasn't sure if this that was their first or their second maybe but. yeah i want to say 2013 was the 
black hole year where there wasn't a Mar. I think you're they, right. They combined with Conclave for that one right. one year. Right. Right. Okay. I think the yeah. last time I was was at a Mar, I think was was eleven. Uh, then maybe it was twelve. That was the year that there wasn't Th- one. That could be. I don't know. Yeah. Well, uh, Jeff, uh, you have been out on the circuit, so uh, any chance you can give us an update on uh, the uh, – you went out west to the Overland Expo show, and I think you went to Texas for the SCAR uh, event? I did, and I can fill in um, – all of us are are doing this podcast from the Northeast. So I had the pleasure of being sent by Rovers Magazine to cover the Sand Rover Rally in the month of March – when we were just accumulating our 100th inch of snow here in Maine, <laughs> I was forced to go to the panhandle of Florida, where it was a horrifying 75 to 80 degrees and sunny every day. I want to pause on those words. He was forced to get away oh. from the w- harsh winter weather. Where, where it was horrifyingly Horrifying. 75. <laughs> never, has, never has a journalist been subjected to such miserable conditions <laughs> as that one. I can tell. I can tell. I can see in your in your eyes. <laughs> it was miserable, right? And um, Mike Ragsdale, who is a frankly a local entrepreneur and defender owner, uh, active with the Chamber of Commerce, with these little beach towns in the Florida Panhandle area, created this event out of whole cloth. Had about twenty Land Rovers show up in year one. He had about forty in year two, and this is year three. And he's now at 80 and growing. There is a very active Gulf Coast Land Rover Club out of Mobile, Alabama. Um, They showed up in force. There was some wonderful muddy off-roading in a state park area. There was some fine sort of beach trails that you could do. We wound up um, on a beachfront location uh, admiring some beautiful product uh, from the very newest Land Rovers that were brought over from the Mobile dealership to some spectacularly restored 2As, a lot of Defenders, some fine custom jobs, too. Uh, People really came all out for this, and given the weather and the location, it was very hard to be uh, miserable on that day. I will also say that that area of Florida is freed from just about all of the kitsch or overwhelming senior citizen presence of other parts of coastal Florida, and it was a blast. It was a wonderful time. I'm sorry, Florida? Uh, I, that That's not SCAR. I'm sorry, right? I'm, or have, did I get confused? It is the Sand Rover Rally. I nearly, I just needed to show off that I made it south in the middle of winter. Oh, okay. We haven't gotten to SCAR I'm yet. sorry. I'm sorry. I was, I had SCAR in my mind. I, I'm sorry about that. There is a SCAR on your mind, definitely. Yes, there is. <laughs> <laughs> now, and then... Not long after that, I did go out to cover the South Central Area Rover Rally, the SCAR event of Texas Rovers, which had 104 Land Rovers present. Wow. Uh, First time they'd crossed 100, I believe. Wow. And what a turnout. I had a fabulous off-road park called Banwell Mountain. And they rent it for the weekend. It's closed except to participants. Hmm. There's terrific camping in several areas of this enormous park. Um, there's also a couple of cabins for, for folks with families or whatever. Uh, some fo- some rovers were trailered there from all over. Uh, license plates from Louisiana and Mississippi, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and all over Texas. Others drove directly there. The trails are very steep, very challenging. They're well marshaled. Um, those who want to rock climb can rock climb. If you want to bury yours in mud, you can bury it in mud. Um, the weather was perfectly Texan. So when it was hot and dry, it was very hot and dry. When it was going to pour, it was uh, thunder, lightning, hail, and a tremendous mud uh, on the clay trails. Great off-roading, great event. We even lost power for half a day. Um around the site, but uh, it was really a delightful time, and I can't praise the Texas Rovers organizers, the club volunteers who put so much effort into this event, but make it so successful. It's really quite a delightful time. One of the real pleasures is they had Don Floyd, uh, who is a former Camel Trophy participant and competitor, and now an instructor with Land Rover at their various events, 
um, make a, a presentation on the newer Land Rovers and off-roading in the new Land Rover product. And it wasn't a sales pitch in any way, but a very technical explanation on how you use the electronic controls to your best advantage on uh, significant off-road situations. He was very gregarious and very, very skilled in his knowledge. I got to ride around with him a bit, too. Great fun. Um, wonderful guy. Nice. Interesting. Very, very good event. I, I recommend it highly to anybody who could make that trip out. Even if you fly out, somebody from Texas Rovers will stuff you in their vehicle and get you to the site. It's about two hours east of Dallas. <laughs> oh, okay. East of Dallas. I was wondering what part of Dallas. Uh, so, so the Texas trick would be to fly into Dallas and then uh, take something off the lot at the Land Rover dealer for a test drive. Yeah. Uh, the the dealership is on to us. <laughs> <laughs> that kills that idea. Um, the, the Land Rover franchises in that area are all owned by one company, and that company is actually a supporter of Texas Rovers. Um the general manager of the one I interviewed last year, Land Rover Frisco, um, actually has attended the event himself. He's that kind of enthusiast. It seems like an opportunity. The other thing about to going to Southern to events, up. guys, and one of you alluded to it when you asked about a discovery, was we just see the Land Rovers that were more steel than aluminium uh, present in their wonderful form without full restoration. I go to an event like SCAR or down at the Sand Rover Rally even, and you see Discovery 1s, Range Rover Classics, um, without any tailgate rust, without any significant restoration, so that the funds that you might have for your Land Rover can go into off-road kit. At, at SCAR, I've never seen more kit piled onto a Rover because nobody ever had to buy a frame. Good point. Yeah. Or patch the rust holes or whatever, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Or tailgate or patch the rust holes. Or do a frame um, over. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Impressive. All the money I've put into mine for, for those purposes, you could instead put into your kit. Oh. So or what a great trucks. group. And, you know, it's fun to see and hear folks who sound just like they ought to be good old boys or hot-ass Texas girls. Um Talking about Land Rovers instead of Chevy trucks. It's terrific. <laughs> love them to death. You sound like you might be an expert on the hot-ass Texas girl. I would love to become more expert at them. They're all charming. <laughs> They're all wonderful. This actually sounds like a really good opportunity. Like you, if you say that the, the dealer is, is all one company, it seems like that would be an opportunity for them to bring out a bunch of demonstrators. And they and they have. In, they didn't this year, but they have in the past. What's really interesting is that one dealership in Austin is seriously considering picking up, um, even at wholesale, Discovery 2s, LR3s, and then kitting them out with a mild lift, putting a winch on them, but doing it in a factory-type manner so that you then buy it off the lot, ready to be a combination of your uh, you know, SUV plus your off-road vehicle. And they're actually talking seriously about doing that. It'd be interesting if they could do that with some sort of uh, certified pre-owned program. That's a, and that's exactly what they're talking about doing. Wow. It would be then become a, 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 a dealer vehicle as opposed to a kitted out custom thing that uh, you buy privately. Interesting. They would stand behind the vehicle. Good idea. So, and also you were out west uh, at the Overland Expo? Uh, first time I'd ever been to Overland Expo, um, and I was uh, totally unprepared. Uh, the reason I had decided to attend was that the Land Rover instructor team that I had met at uh, various events, these are the folks who are ex-Camel Trophy people, men and women both, um, all urged me to go. Land Rover sets up a demonstration course at many events. Um, they did it at the Rolex Kentucky equestrian event that I went to, and they do it at Overland Expo every year to give both demonstrations of new Land Rover capabilities, also to bring a few of those Camel Trophy vehicles that somehow managed to stay in the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we'll even take you out in your own other brand vehicle, 
to show you the best techniques for off-roading. So if you're an expeditioner and you're going to tackle territory that you've never seen before, how do you manage uh, ascents, descents, side slopes? How do you manage stream crossings? How do you extricate yourself? There were fabulous demonstrations on proper winching techniques, building log bridges. They actually had a group build a log bridge. Hmm. Uh, I met a number of uh, UK and uh, Australian Camel Trophy competitors as well, who also put on presentations. They're all sort of a fraternity and, and sorority of themselves, but they all know each other from country to country. It was quite a set of uh, opportunities. There, there were thousands and thousands of people who drove all kinds of vehicles uh, there, camped, and found themselves, Dave, like you described your stream bed, in the middle of a torrential downpour one night which had most of the Land Rovers towing other people out because you just couldn't get <laughs> right your on. overland vehicle out of that mud area. Once that uh, dry soil turned to thick clay, you weren't going anywhere. Yeah. But overall, the event was superb. The, the opportunity to look at so much gear created around overlanding and... Um, off-roading was terrific. There were vendors, hundreds and hundreds of vendors with interesting product. Yeah, I think you met some of our friends uh, who are also members of our local Fort Pitt Land Rover group, uh, Scooter Wickham and Mike yeah. Henniger. Mm -hmm. I um, did. Yeah. I Mike did. And, Scooter. and I went to the LT Knife yeah, L vendor display. Did you buy something? Where I was, you should, <laughs> I, when I opened up my luggage, because I knew you weren't supposed to take this knife on the plane. When I opened up my luggage, I found a TSA note in my luggage uh, that it had been examined because they saw a very large knife in a sheath. Right. But I did. I, I have a beautiful knife created by Mike and Scott. Just uh, that, It's a work of art. That knife is scooter sharp. It is. Yeah. And I've already used it. Good. I've already... Uh, it's been invaluable. Um, but that was just one of many. I want to... I want to tout one item that really intrigued me. You guys carry ammo boxes full of tools or or gear? Yep. Right? I carry you ammo know boxes small, full of ammo. Right. You know the small size ammo box? Sure. The military one? Yeah. Right. So a company out of Florida created an air compressor that fits in a small ammo box. Ooh. It has alligator clips, long ones, to go to your battery. The air compressor sits in a compartment uh, that's properly ventilated, and the hose that they provide with it is not that sort of looped, kink, cheap air hose that will disintegrate once it gets cold, but a nice, thick, strong hose that will clearly work in winter weather. That thing will run for 15 or 20 minutes before it needs to cool off and will air up anything. It's a fabulous piece of, piece of kit. It was another purchase that I had to have to take with me. It's small. It fits in the back of my vehicle uh, easily. And I think because it's portable, it's more valuable than having a built-in compressor in your vehicle. Yeah. Good call. Yeah, yeah I, think I've, I think I've seen the one that you were referencing, Jeff. And uh, it was pretty, pretty spectacular. I think I saw it's it called on your Facebook. Air Armor. Sorry? I think I saw it Carol? on your Facebook page. Yes, Air Armor. I just... I, I put it on there just to show people what it looked like, but I've been using it since I have uh, leaky tires on a couple of vehicles and pieces of uh, really? landscape equipment that I use. Not on my Rover, no. But um, I actually aired down one of the Rover tires just to see what would happen. Uh, Dave, if you come back up to the main winter romp, you'll see it there. Excellent, because this upcoming February is my every other year. Nice. How much is the is that... Uh... Compressor. I believe that it's in the hundred and eighty to two hundred dollar range. That's not bad. We can yeah, put a link in the show notes. Yeah, we'll track it down. Yeah, but I would uh, sure I can send you a link to it. Uh, but I'm just impressed with the quality of it, and um, there's it, it looks like it's something that would last. That comes in a nice sealed uh, ammo container too, so that it's waterproof. Even better. Now, Jeff, you said something about um, 
you know, demonstrations with non Land Rover vehicles. Did I catch that that was being conducted by Land Rover? If you Land Rover was willing to put you on the course in your vehicle, if you wanted to have instruction from Land Rover instructors as to how to best off road and safely navigate. And, and was uh, there emphasis on how the non Rover vehicle did not measure up? I think it was self evident. Okay. I think it was the, right. the fact that you even needed to have the instruction said that you weren't in a vehicle that was really as capable <laughs> as that Land Rover. Very good. <laughs> uh, Jeep was there, and uh, uh, Jeep had some Wranglers running around uh, on their own course. But the Land Rover one was really impressive, and the quality of the instructors. I mean, these are guys like Lee McGee and, uh, as I said, Don Floyd. Um, Jim Sweat was there. Um, uh, Don West was there. Daphne Green was there. Uh, just an impressive array of people who've, uh, Fred Monzies, who've really set the tone for how Land Rover wants to present its product to people. Um, and yes, they were new Land Rovers, but wow, they are wicked capable. <laughs> I <gotta say. laughs> it's amazing. Just amazing. Uh, did it not? The, the interesting part, too, I, I, I do want to stress this. I know that as enthusiasts, we worry sometimes that the Land Rover product, in order to meet safety and emission standards and all, is getting too complicated for the home enthusiast to maintain effectively. And there are just dealer tools and dealer capabilities that are required. But that being said, it's very interesting to me that many of the instructors who are there really at Land Rover's behest to, frankly, help tout and demonstrate the new product, are truly enthusiasts at heart. I mean, they pull out photos of the Land Rovers that they own, and they can be old 90s, old 110s. They're going to be discoveries. There's going to be classics in there. Um, they all maintain and enjoy the, what we call the Heritage Land Rovers every bit as much as they um, understand the capabilities and can train you on the brand new product. Very impressive. Nice. Did it not snow while you were there? It did. It did snow. Because <laughs> <laughs> well, I know Graham uh, A to A was like, you know, hey, he's headed up to Alaska and he's going to get into some snow. And then he goes to the Overland Expo in Flagstaff, Arizona. And hey, but, it snowed. Surprise. But yeah. guys, you ha you have to realize everyone there was horrified at the snow. We were 7,000 feet up in Flagstaff, Arizona, and I'm coming out of Maine. So it snowed for a night. It went away. Yeah. yeah. Come on, everybody. <laughs> but what was funny, what was funny is that a number of folks who came are either from the Phoenix area or they came from even more, uh, over from California. Um, and it was very entertaining. It, really, there was no more than a, you know, an inch at the most of snow anywhere. But to watch little kids running around gathering snow to make these six-inch high snowmen <laughs> and having it beside their tent in the morning was quite a treat. Yep. Was it fluffy snow or was it wet? It was soaking wet. Oh, it was soaking wet. That, that's but good. Uh, another entertaining moment was, for me, was uh, the presence of three, count them, three dormobiles in one location. Whoa. Wow. One of them being Terry Ann's? One of them being Terry Ann, whom I thought, I didn't realize it, but she lives in Flagstaff, so that wasn't far. But a fellow named Sean Gruber came over from California, and a fellow named Ian, no, I'm sorry, from Denver, and Ian Kelly came over from Malibu, California in his dormobile. They nice. all stayed in their dormobiles. Nice. Um, you have probably all experienced the delight of having somebody else's Land Rover have a little problem when you can actually fix it. I call More that a job, Jeff. <laughs> yes, you do, Harold. It's not a delight to you. I understand. But the delight is it's not yours. Right. Yours didn't cause. So Sean limps in, complains that uh, he has he has a uh, he has a classic two point six six cylinder in his dormobile. Oh, nice. Right hand drive. Mm -hmm. um, it was barely getting up hills, he said. And of course, we all joke, well, how yeah. would you know? That's stock, you know? yeah. Right, it's stock. But it was really in uh, checking each spark plug wire. <clears throat> I found the one that was snapping at me. 
um, and therefore that was the bad one. And uh, he had another set of wires that he had bought from Ike Goss at some point, swapped out one wire, and suddenly all six cylinders are firing. Nice. Took out that spark plug, cleaned it off. And I got a note from him when he got home about how thrilling it was to have the thing running at full tilt all the way to Denver. And uh, again, a reminder of the elegant simplicity of the series Land Rover. Yeah. That just isn't a whole lot that's going to go wrong. Yeah. So what's Dave, next? Dave, aren't you a Discovery owner? I'm a Discovery owner several times over, and I've purchased a Series 3. Excellent. Can't yeah. wait. He's I mentioned that because a uh, uh, person on the island here that I live on bought this much older, much abused, but cosmetically handsome late Disco 2. He stopped me in the ferry line to say, it's, uh, I love my car, I love my car, but it's making an awful noise. So I said, well, let me listen. So we pop the hood. She starts it up. And remind you, I'm a Series 2A owner, and I'm listening to a Rover V8. Right. Yeah. I don't hear any noise. I don't hear anything. <laughs> Nothing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Tell her to so, turn the radio down. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, she said, oh, yes, yeah, you, you can hear it when, uh, when you're in the car. So I had, a, I closed the hood and I stepped in the vehicle. I shut the door and I turned it on. And I just about have my head against the firewall trying to hear what sounds like just a, a little tap at noise at some point. Idle air control valve. Is that what it is? Yep. When it, are they hydraulic lifters? They are hydraulic lifters. Yeah. And if your oil pressure is low, they will make a clicking. And she said that, uh, uh, yes, that's exactly what she was describing. And I also wonder uh, just if the oil's been changed and it's running thin and she's getting lower oil pressure because of that. Yeah, they, they also had a problem with the, the pump casing on, on that engine in that period, too, where they wouldn't deliver enough oil pressure. Well, I think, stop... I think most of those have been weeded out by now. Well, that, that could be true, but you never know. There might be one or two still out there. Yeah. Did you swap out the oil pump? Is that it, Harold? Well, the, no, you the, swap out the engine block. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, before that. Well, the oil pump actually... Well, well, I mean, that was Rover's fix. It's not an external pump like you're used to. It runs oh. on the front of the crankshaft, and the, and the front timing cover is part of the housing that the oil pump runs in. So right. it's, it's a little more involved of a repair, but yeah, basically yeah. you swap all that stuff out. Got it. Thank you. So um, what... I'll, But in the meantime, it was hardly any noise at all. But she is referring it to when it runs for a while, she hears more tap it noise, but yeah, very I'd, little. I'd look at the oil pressure. I yeah. think one of the shortcomings of the of the disco is the lack of oil pressure gauge. Hmm. Right. Can you screw a pressure gauge in there, Harold? Uh, well, yeah, you can. If you take a out sandwich. The, if you take out the sending unit for the idiot light, yeah, uh, you have to get an adapter because that's going to be an M12 thread on that. But the, but. Uh, SunPro, one of the manufacturers, makes an adapter that will take you from the M12 to 8-inch pipe, which is sort of the standard for gauges. At that point, yeah, you're good to go. Good. And Thank you. There is another option. There's a sandwich adapter that will spin on right where your oil filter goes, and then the oil filter spins on to that. And you screw your, uh, your gauge into that. My solution costs less than $10, Dave. Well, yeah, I'll give you that. My solution is even easier, though. <laughs> so what is next for you, Jeff? Where are you going to in the next couple months? Uh, anything for the magazine? Uh, my next ones will probably not, won't be until the fall. I do know that there are a couple of events that Peter Vollers of the Vermont Overland Organization has established. I know there's, uh, there's going to be one again in the middle of July. Uh, he has his Vermont Overland Trophy events that he tries to run a few times during the summer. Um, Dave, you mentioned some of the other uh, Northeastern events that I've heard. But my next big event, will pro I'm sure, will be the British Invasion in Stowe, Vermont in September, right. which is always a wonderful Land Rover turnout, right. uh, more like a, a, a car event than it is an off-road event. But it is a great gathering of Canadian and Northeastern Land Rover enthusiasts. There'll be a good 70 or 80 Land Rovers there every year. We need to get Morgan to go over there, too, and they can do a 
hook up and yeah and nick also goes nick likes to go to stowe yeah. for that uh, nick yeah. so we could have a special report from up there from that would be great that would be great yeah. that'd be great we should and do. then i will i do hope to go to mar and i would like to go to arkansas uh those would be in october okay good cool. Uh, we we invite you down to the Pittsburgh Vintage Grand Prix, which is I know it may be too too uh, too soon of an invitation for you for this year, but something to think about maybe for next year. They have uh, it's the largest or the only uh, road race that takes place on city streets for vintage cars. You know I've read about it. Um, Dave Lachance is a friend and the editor of Hemming Sport and Exotic. Mm-hmm. He talks about it a lot. Yeah. Loves yep. the event, yep. and there's uh, it's a quite a good British uh, car show as well as part of the whole international show, and yes, a, a good turnout of rovers from our local club. Yep, there's rovers, there's uh, Triumphs, MGs, Aston Martins, Rolls Royce. There's really nice turnout. A little bit of everything. Thing. Yeah, you, you're, I'm always amazed at what shows up because you don't see this stuff normally on the streets, and then all of a sudden one day, boom, they all they all pop a, pop over from wherever it is they live. So. But yeah, something to think about. You might. I think you'd probably it would, enjoy that I, show. I, I have no doubt it would be a wonderful time. <laughs> In the magazine, we have to be so Land Rover centric <laughs> that uh, the one column where I mentioned an MG is part of the column. Uh, I still get gentle grief from Mark Laterney of Rovers North for having an MG presence in there. As you should. <laughs> <laughs> Well, my point was no self-respecting my, my triumph this, owner. This couple took their MG of ninety-one thousand miles and absolutely no mechanical provenance, owned by a set of abusive owners prior. They had absolutely no knowledge of the vehicle at all, from upstate New York to California, <laughs> and they did it with with sort of a triple A CAD that hardly had to be called upon. And I think they replaced a headlight. That was it, the whole trip. <laughs> Some people have luck. Yes, they do. I agree, but yes. he still has the vehicle, and it hasn't been torn apart yet, <laughs> and he loves it to death. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Some people, like you said, some people have luck. Yeah. Sadly, Sadly not me. No. And nonetheless, <laughs> no self-respecting Triumph owner would really want to be writing about an MG. I only, look, according to uh, Rovers North, no self-respecting Land Rover enthusiast should be mentioning MG in our magazine. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, he did something that too many Rover owners won't do, which is my vehicle has high mileage. I'm afraid to take it somewhere. Yeah, right. That's what we want to do. Yep. We need to see him on the road. Absolutely. Exactly. So speaking of seeing Rovers, just to kind of get back to your Florida trip that you mentioned earlier. Uh, was that the trip that you went in, uh, to a bar and saw something particularly interesting? That's Alabama, isn't it? It wasn't in Alabama. That was Birmingham, Alabama. Very good memory. That was the uh, same trip. The Florida bar, what, the things I saw interesting were female, and yes, they were wonderful. <laughs> at the Birmingham, Alabama bar, I walked in. At I was the guest of Adventure Motor Cars in Birmingham, Alabama. Stephen Ogletree buys and sells some 30 to 40 defenders a year for the purpose of getting them back on the road, refreshed, and keeping them in circulation with enthusiast owners. He's a wonderful guy. He's got a great crew. Um, You'll see an article on them in an upcoming issue of the magazine because of the nice work they do. But uh, he took took me to a bar with he and his wife, and there on the, the wall behind the bar is... A cut-up 109, complete from fender to rear door. When you go around the corner of the bar, the rear door is absent, and there are the shelves of the top-shelf liquors. Out of the side of the 109 are several taps of local brews brewed in Birmingham. Uh, it, we featured it in the magazine because it was it, it i have photos that will be in the magazine i mean because it was such a marvelous sight it even is. if it was a 109 and there were pieces of a 109 you wanted to take home with you <laughs> i'm impressed that the, that the the taillights were functional as well well separate they wiring. were functional it's true so were the side lamps and so on the headlights i mean yeah yes it was a, a, a quite a sight and he knew i would be blown away when i uh, saw it he yeah. was right Yep, that's that's on a must list C now of anyone traveling to that part of the uh, In fact, you know, uh, uh, we have a Facebook page for Rovers North, and 
uh, we usually get a few thousand likes sort of with each post. When I posted that, it immediately shot up to like 6,000 likes <laughs> when I posted photos of the bar. Nice. Now, now this is in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, what's the name of the establishment? Ooh. I'm embarrassed to say it began with a C, and I'm going to have to get back to you with its name. I don't I, remember. I, I think Birmingham is just big enough that if you roll in there and say, where's that bar with the Land Rover in it, they might not know. They will know. There's will only it? a handful of fun bars in their funky downtown district. It was a lot of fun. It was a okay. great place, and the beer was great. That's good to know. That's that's what I want to hear. Good beer. That's what I thought you might, John. Uh, absolutely. Right. I'm all over that. How, over how that. is the whiskey? The whiskey was at the Rolex Land Rover event in Kentucky, where they actually walk into your hotel and there's a bourbon sampling table right there in the lobby. There you go, Harold. I'm sold. Sounds like my kind of hotel. It it really was, mm -hmm. Dave. It was nothing like the place we stay in in Maine. <laughs> well, outside, or is that the shack? <laughs> Isn't that a shack? No, I think it's a day's in. A day's in. <laughs> So that brings us to a close. Another edition of the Center Steer Podcast. This has been number 27, and uh, we'll have the next edition for you in about a month, although my vacation's coming up, so there may be a little delay in that. But, uh, again, that's it. Hope you enjoyed the show. Uh, my thanks to Dave. Hey, everybody. If you, if you don't hear from me for, on number 28, just know that I'm out getting mud on the tires. <laughs> And Harold, uh, it's been fun talking. I, I uh, really want to emphasize the community aspect of having a Land Rover. I think that was sort of the underscore in this this yeah. particular episode. I would agree. We had a couple of GoFundMe's to go check out. Yes, and all the way live from Vinyl Haven, Maine, Jeff Aronson. Thanks for joining us today, Jeff. Thank you all very much. I just want to say to get out and enjoy your Land Rover. That's what they're all about. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the podcast today. Uh, go out and enjoy your Land Rover, and we'll talk to you next month. Thanks. The Center Steer theme song, Sunset Rider by the Triton, is available from Mibio's Music Alley. Check it out at music.mibio.com. And their son bought a Series 2A, sort of a bits of this, bits of that 2A. I have something As they like that. They really all are. <laughs> <laughs>